Okay. okay. Call the meeting to order. Mm -hmm. Approval of minutes. I guess we don't have minutes to approve. Is that correct? No. No minutes. Okay. Comments from the public? Dan? Public. Uh, nothing special. Still just curious on the state certifications, if we've any have come in yet on uh, free cash. Well, I think Brian will get to that at some point. Yeah. Well, well it's not our agenda, but um, we can discuss it if we want. I would put it under the chair. Yeah, I should shut up. Yeah. Uh, you're prepared to, to talk about it later? Are you trying to minister it off We We have a preliminary certification, yeah. Okay. We can talk about it later? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Schedule appointments, 6 o'clock was <clears throat> continuation of poll hearing on Egypt Road. And so, I guess so. So, what we need to do is we need to open the hearing, and we need to continue the hearing, okay. and we need to close the hearing. Okay. Hmm. So, continue and close? So, we should, oh no, I'm just kidding. We should uh, continue the rest of the meeting. Continue, continue the rest. So, so okay. we need to open the poll hearing. And we should continue the poll hearing until the next meeting, October 25th, 2017, at 6 o'clock p.m. Mm -hmm. at 4 Sandy Lane. Okay, and we, they we promise they're going to be here with their poop in a group? Well, let's hope so. Okay. Um, so we're, we're, we're just being We are waiting nice. for additional information okay. um, from Verizon slash Eversource as to the poll locations and revised um, text descriptions of the publications. Okay, that's fine. But do we have to move that or just do it? Um, we should vo vote to continue the hearing. I will move to continue the hearing. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Yeah. Aye. Okay, so just one quick thing is, so this is not correct, even the plan that's... The plan that, that you have in front of you dated October 10th, 2017, yeah. is correct. Okay, that's the, that's the correct one. Keith and I have field verified that. It is definitely not the scale because if there, yeah. everything is compressed really tightly. Yeah, it's like this map only squeezed. Yep. And I think it, the, even the Google map shows the same general contours. They show the road as being a little smoother, but that's yeah. not yeah. unusual, right? And this reflects where the stakes are currently. Keith met with um, the Sears. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Sears bangers. are 27 or 33? The Sears are 27. 27. Uh, the Sears, uh, the Thayers are the ones who are building lots, Eversource mm -hmm. and Verizon. They all got together and figured it out. Mm -hmm. Well, they figured what out? They agreed on the poll locations. And assuming Verizon slash Comcast can put in the sandbox together, that'll be the resolution. I see. So the the existing one is the one that's not dark colored, the X. Correct. And then the, the four others are the ones to be placed. Yep. And it looks like they managed to get three out of the four on the opposite side of the street and not putting one in the place that would bother the Sears the most. Correct. Is that seem, that's yep, like that's a reasonable? A, that's a wooded area. That's so that's what we expect area. to happen next week. Next yes. time it'll be come in, come out. See what can happen with it, strong communication and and actual data. But it's, it still puzzles me why why they're putting it one across on the other side of the road. And I know their explanation because they cut trees. Well, you got trees on both sides of the road and. Maybe one you're not cutting pine or, or maple or whatever, but you're still cutting trees. Well, but I think yeah. I, I think it's also fair to my guess is that at some point um, the property owner wants to develop those those parcels of land, obviously, and then you would have a potentially ch more challenging time selling those those parcels with four poles over there as opposed to having them intermittent. Or no, I could believe that there's fewer trees along the path, along this path, than there is along this path. Because this is all wooded. Maybe and this is at least, because you're, you're over, over the road, and the, the road, road doesn't have, technically doesn't have any trees on it. So right. I can believe that there's fewer yeah. trees being cut, and that's 
you know, so they, it's either cut the trees and use three poles or put in a third pole and cut fewer trees. Yeah. Which Okay, well, so we'll wait to see what they Okay, okay so we, we need to vote to... Well, we voted we to continue. We voted to continue. Oh, okay. Okay. We're early for our, our 631. Uh, let's move to old business, and then town hall project update. Town hall project update. And if you recall last meeting, there's a requirement under Massachusetts Historic Commission grant that the grant agreement between the town and MHC, Mass Historic Commission, be signed before the town signs its contract with Westfield Construction. I was promised MHC is supposed to sign that contract by the end of the week, and then that will allow us to um, execute our agreement with Westfield Construction. We have the contract from town, it's been reviewed by town council, and we are ready to um, signed the agreement, Westfield's reviewing it now. Um, and Westfield's currently putting together, even though they're not under contract, they're currently putting together a starting the project schedule. Um, How quickly, um, did, do they have a start date on that schedule, tentatively? I haven't seen the project schedule. Oh, you have not? Okay. No. Um, what, what happens if MHC fails to sign the contract by the end of this week? We get really loud. Call them again. <laughs> just, uh, just wait. I, I guess, right? We have no other option. We're at their mercy. Is there a yeah. Of, yeah. Or, or we don't take their money. Yeah. I prefer to take their money. Is I it useful too, at this point for uh, people other than you to call? Um, I don't think so. If, mm -hmm. if we don't see it by the end of this week and or next week, we should probably. Um, Everybody can ask to call, for example. Yeah. 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 So that's where we are in terms of in terms of the, the spot of the construction. Okay, we, do we we have what thirty days after bid opening to award? Is that still a valid time? We have we have thirty days. Yep, to award. Which was from September thirteenth, right? Fifteenth, thirteenth. Yeah, I'll check. Um, that's that's the date at which Westfield. Um, uh, no, it's thirty days from. It's actually thirty days. If you need approval from a state agency, it's actually thirty days from the approval of the state agency. Oh, okay. So it tolls that time period. So it's not thirty from the bid opening. Correct. Right. Okay. Okay. So we're in good shape there. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not too, too concerned about that. Okay. okay. Um, other other things that are happening with the town hall were we're about halfway uh, sorting through stuff from the vault. <laughs> um, there's stuff that goes back. Mm -hmm. There's some bo some books there that start in the 1700s. Seriously? Yeah. That's kind of cool, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's pretty neat. Yeah. Is um, mass historical? Not mass. Is our historical? Society and commission and all the other people involved with this. Well, there are actually records that we need to keep. Yeah, but they can. They should be so, so down the road, should, should we be looking? We should be looking at preservation. And but some of them might want to pour through these things. I mean, there might be some pretty interesting yeah. stuff there. They should be at least made aware. Yeah. That we're uncovering some, shall we say, antiquated materials. Yes. Well, there, there's, there's other stuff in there that we made them aware of, not necessarily books or records, and they, they have no interest. So, okay, I mean, well, how many times do you ask them? Repeatedly. I mean, some of his old stuff goes back, not 1700s, but 1950s, 1940s, whatever, and they don't see a need to keep it. So, okay. uh, and, and even uh, even that safe in, in the assessor's office, you know, that initially they had no interest in it until I brought it up that uh, maybe we should preserve that somewhere and it's going to be in the hallway. You know, when you come in the doorway on the left side, you're going to see that safe in the hallway because it's an artifact, I guess, that, that's been in the building for since 1930s, probably, or 40s. 
Yeah, yeah or, or older. Other than that, so it's one of the few original, I guess, furniture pieces, you want to call it, in a building that we're saving, so. Uh, okay. So that's where we are. Okay. Do we want a blue school? Do we want a... Or you want to... Oh, yeah. oh, oh, we can take Zach. All the 630 people here? Well, I don't know. Is Father's... this important if it's... I think Keith was planning on coming. Well, I think we should wait in case others wanted to come at 630. So, okay. okay. Well, boy, are you optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> We've just tripled. <laughs> I know, it's amazing. <laughs> I'm what's watching the, Red Sox. What's, so it's like, what's the capacity of this room for crying out loud? The fire marshal. Oh, the fire marshal's here. Keep us on. Are we safe, John? We are. Okay, good. Tonight. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Blue School RFP. Brian? Mm -hmm. That's this thing, right? That is the that thing. seal on the front. This is a draft request for proposals. I should just say blue school, not RFP, but the Genesis blue school RFP. Um, we don't own the blue school. As we talked in the last meeting, this is this would be a request for proposals that would allow the town to dispose of the lot immediately to the north of the blue school. In the co op, the idea would that it would be that simultaneously Frontier Regional School District would also issue a request for proposals, which I've seen a draft of, um, and it would allow an interested developer to bid on both of those at the same time. We talked about the challenges with those parcels, mainly being the cross easements with the septic and leach field, um, the town's lot, and um, the playing fields and the parking. Both of those are perpetual easements that would um, continue in perpetuity unless they're either released or if they come in common ownership. And they're released that way. Remind me, Brian, why we're not just collaboratively I understand that ownership is two different entities yeah but you could just release one RFP for both lots in a joint effort between the school district and the town I wasn't we're not sure about that no. well isn't that just a call to somebody um, it just seems like it's gonna get confusing to people well, it gives them the option of. I get that, but, no, but, but I understand it, that those don't. That, but no one's going to legitimately bid on one of the one of the parcels without the other one involved. I'll, I'll double check. I, I think there's issues with that. Because two different owners. Because because of the two different owners. Okay. okay well, one can into it, though. sign away their power of attorney. I, I I'm just. It just seems like it's overly bureaucratic. I wouldn't argue with that. Well, I don't think we want to give up our yeah our authority to act on, on our lot. We're not giving up our authority to act on our lot. We're just saying that the RFP is issued by right. a, a collaborative body. We're not giving up any authority. No. We wouldn't become from any authority. We, I mean. The town of Whateley needs to receive the bids. Then they would see their, I mean, we could do it for on behalf of the district and the town combined. And I'm yeah. guessing that they would love that off their plate. Or off my plate. <laughs> I don't speak for, I only speak for that. I don't know. I, I just, I'll, 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 let me, let me make a phone call and see. Okay. Um, yeah, because I mean, is their RFP look very different from this RFP? Um, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. I looked over there. I mean, all the stuff, all the stuff on the back end, uh -huh. we need, and all the stuff yeah, on the back that, end. It looks like there's a lot of documentation. They need. Like but they're the, what they're looking for in terms of calls. What they're looking for in terms of uh, the, the specific opportunities that might exist. It, they they may run counter to one another, and then. Where do we stand? So it, it just this is this is mind boggling. There are two RFPs to me. I'll make a phone call. Okay. Uh, 
I hope you're right. Let's I'm happy to put it all on your plate, too. Yeah, I, I know you are. <laughs> John, that, that John was, was about to say, I'm, I'm fine speaking for you, Brian. I guess that was never never discussed. They, they proceeded with theirs first, because we saw it what, a couple of weeks ago at, at one of their meetings, so. They, wait, 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 they didn't bother to bring it to us. They just said it's... No, I've, se I've seen theirs. Yeah, we've seen right, theirs. Th theirs has not been issued yet. It hasn't been issued, but, but they did their draft so one. In this case, we is draft. Fred and Brian. Right, okay. we is not the board of select. Well, not the board, the no. Right. And we told them that it was not the board, but it's frontiers. It's not. I get that, but we should be working together for once in a. I mean, this is this is our attempt. I'll check on the 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 single RFP thing. This was our attempt to work together yeah. because they will be issued at the same time, and they reference they will reference each other and say, "Okay, go see this one. If you have this one, you'll see contact mm -hmm. yeah. Frontier Regional School District. They'll see the lot too." Um, it, my fear is that this is what's required, but I'll double check. If it's required, that's fine. But if it's not required, gosh. Yeah, I would agree with you. Okay. okay. Um, let's talk about timing for a little, for a minute. Um, let's say this goes out. This needs to be advertised in the Central Register. So the earliest this could go out with, with the date today would be. Um, October 25th, we'll go out that Wednesday. Um, needs to run for 30 days in the <coughs> Central Register before the, uh, proposals can be due, before the deadline. So that that dumps us on Thanksgiving. So let's say it's either the last week in December or December, uh, last week in November, or let's say December 1st to make it easy for counting. At that point, we would, taking taken an optimistic approach, let's say we find someone who wants both lots. We would need a town meeting vote to sell our parcel. Um, so I guess it, it's a question, is that something that the board's comfortable with that is special? Because this would, this would see us We'd be, we'd be considering this in December or January, um, where we would need authority from the from the residents to sell the lot. If the school goes forward and we don't go forward, I'm not suggesting that, but eventually they're going to force our hand if they're going to sell it with our with our uh, right of first refusal. Once they, once they provide us with a, a written offer that they have a buyer, we have 30 days to decide whatever we want to do, if we want to exercise our option or not, which would also require a special town meeting. Um, so I guess my... Yeah, how much notice do people get on a special town meeting? 14 days is the minimum notice. That's the minimum notice. Yeah. So I, I guess the first question is, is this something that we would want to consider at a special town meeting? And if not, that's going to shift our timeline. Mm. You know, to, yeah, to, make to, it so. to March or something. Yeah, where January, February, or, right. or sometime like that. In a, conversations with the school district, they want to get rid of it as soon as they would be rid of it now if they had their. Is the school right. district being overly optimistic at the demand for this property? I think they want to see what's out there. I get it, but I don't think they know. It, and right, they, so I would I argue they they're know. probably being overly optimistic. They just want to get rid of it off their hands. And right, but if there's no buyer, uh, it doesn't matter what their timeline. If there's no, no. buyer, if, if they don't get, if they get no responses, then they keep it. I mean, I, I, I would, that we, would that we are in the position that on you know, December second we're considering some really nice offer on this property that we would want to take to town you know that 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 i that's like way optimistic mm -hmm. you know, if, we're, if, if that's our problem then we, we got to really advertise a special town meeting but i'm thinking in the absence of like if we got an offer that we're kind of eh. <laughs> you know it would, it would depend a bit on on what is being offered as to whether i think it would be worth trying to make us or make it work at a special uh town meeting 
but I think it would have, we would, if we were gonna do it at a special town meeting, then we've gotta do like a couple of robocalls uh, to give people a heads up and maybe have some sort of, um, I don't know if a hearing is required, but like a public forum, um, a way to, to explain what, you know, explain what the offer is and why we think it's a good idea and get, you know, so we need a little bit of that. Um, and I don't think that can get done necessarily in two weeks, but that you said two weeks is the minimum notice for putting together you know, the warrant posting and such. Right. If we've got an offer, what's a more realistic timeline of how long we would have to evaluate it and then do our public education, if that's the right word for it, to make sure that people understood it well enough to know to show up for a special time meeting if they're on board or or even if they're not on board, to show up for the town meeting and express that. Yeah. Right. So I think we could build it. We could build it that time. Yeah. Well, we, we we want to, want, I think we'd have to build it more time. Absolutely. So we do this. Yeah. Yeah. Remind anybody that it is the holiday season, and oh, so much happens during the holiday season anyway. Yeah. yeah. We've got to get notification of orders yeah. within 90 days. Once so we have. Um, so we have 90 days. Plus early I mean, that's time. what. That's what they yeah, and, uh, this is why it needs to be a, a combined RFP. This is ex this is exhibit A. This is the poster child. If they have to be separate, then they have to look in so many other ways as identical as possible. Yeah. So that, that well, that, but if it's the, if the we timing really of everything needs. No, I, I agree with you. And the timing of everything needs to. They, they need to play time. ball with us a little bit. If he has to rewrite the RFP, though, we're probably pushing things out into yeah. January, February. You would think so. Well, I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, he's a pretty no, good brain. Not really, maybe next month. Yeah, well, he's yeah, we could, issue. we could. But again, next so. month is, is again, you're, you're talking about, it's, it's October 13th, or it's October 11th today. Yeah. Push it out a month is a week and a half before Thanksgiving. It, it's just not... I don't think it's realistic to no. expect that there's going to be an offer so quickly on it anyway. So we're sort of thinking of the real, we're just thinking of like what if, um, if we really have 90 days to decide on an offer. Well, I mean, we could write whatever time period we want, but we want it to be. Uh, I mean, 90 days realistic. is a reasonable thing. Because we're asking somebody and, to hold an offer open. Right. So I, I think in that sort of period of time, we can do good, you know, uh, advertising, if that's the right word for it, um, for, for a special town meeting. I wouldn't want it to be like so crammed together that we can't actually get the word out. We've got lots of ways to get the word out. Um, you know, if, depending on timing, whether it's near one of the scoops, um, depending on the, the phone calls can happen at any time. We've got Okay, but I guess lots the, of things we can do. The, the first the first question that Ryan is asking is, can we do this at a special town meeting, or do we have to wait to our annual meeting in April? That's that's right. the first thing he's asking for, yeah. and, and I guess I hear us saying that we could do it with a special town meeting. Is that what the rest of us feel like? I, mean, I, I don't think it's ideal, but if it's not our, ideal. if our hand is t is forced, then. Oh, we could make it happen, but this should really happen at a, at, a, at the annual town meeting. This is, a, this is okay. because it's also going to be precedent setting for other pieces of property that might come up for sale. But I guess I'm thinking, what's going to be, what would be presented at either special or annual town meeting? I mean, we, the option is either either sell or not sell. I mean, it's not like we're we're talking about some kind of development going in, or the use of it or not. It's just going to be. Oh, but Fred, I think that I think that some people's perspective on sell or not sell will hinge on usage. I I, I think people are going to want the blue school of the blue school. I think people are going to want to know what's the range of options for 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 the use of the of both parcels. And without that, I think you're going to have a bunch of people saying, how do you expect us to make this decision with such lack of clarity? Well, and the other thing that's going to could play into it is, is the sentiment. There's, there's people that have been to that school. I, I mean, 
educated in that school and their kids were educated and they wanted to see the town keep the school kind of regardless so they're going to they have for sentimental reasons they want to keep it and i think we've been we've been taught we talked some with with uh, frontier on it uh you know we, today we could keep the school if we wanted for a dollar they're willing to take it off their hands and give it to us but but then our question is are we willing to take the liability of that school? I mean, if nobody if nobody wants it, nobody bids on on the, the, the school parcel. Uh, the cost to the next thing is is to sell it as a building lot, and to do that, you probably you won't get much money because you have to tear down the school, tear down the building. We're hearing figures, uh, uh, six digit figures, say. To, to demolish the school and because of asbestos and hazardous material in there. So you're looking at a six digit figure to demolish it. Right. So what is the return investment on the town? Building lots of 95,000 and you're gonna spend 100 plus? There, there's no incentive for the town to, to, I, to no, 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 accept it. No, 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 I agree. So, yeah, but I, th I think that's, that's, that's many decisions down the road. I know, but, but that's one thing that, that we've been talking about and telling Frontier that you know that's why we we're not jumping up and down accepting it for a dollar. That might be a cheap price to have a ball field. Well, if 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 it comes down to we need that, it's a ball field. What's the square footage on that property? Between the two, I don't know. It's two over it's two acres. It's not huge. It's one point three plus the other. You couldn't put a baseball field in that. You can put a soft. You can put a nice softball field. But again, that's one point three. 1.3 acres, so... Plus ours, right? Ours is one acre. Is yeah, so it's 2.3 acres. Oh, it's 2.3 total? Total, total yeah. But I would, I'm just guessing that our, our lot get more, may get more interest because it's it's vacant. You don't have to demolish anything other than maybe the, the septic. And if those dollars yeah, are right, there. people are going to say $100,000 for a... For 2.3 acres? I don't know. That's yeah. not all that outrageous. Probably not. Well, well no. I don't know what it would go, what 2.3 acres in Whaley would go for today of developable land. As two lots? Two no, there's one lot. Oh, one lot? One hundred, hundred twenty-five thousand. So it's a wash. Possible. Yeah, yeah. but or something like that. Last meeting I was just at, all I heard was Whaley has no land for yeah. recreation. Yeah. So that's cheap money. Yeah. Go buy a go buy a piece of land from a farmer. Yeah. Well, there's, that's there's cheap even, money. There's even some you know that have gone for thirty to fifty thousand as well. So. And more than one acre, even for them. Yeah. So, not well, ideal locations, but. So, this, this conversation makes me. I'm no, sorry. <clears throat> to, and D, I mean, so I guess we need to know because the school's looking to go forward. Okay. Um, I think it's a small risk to go forward. A worst case scenario, we get no bids. Worst case scenario, we get no bids. And we're where we are. Can, 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 why can't they slow down a little bit? I don't. They're asking to work with us, but then it's on their schedule, and we don't seem to want to say, "Well, slow down here." Let's if we really want to maximize our opportunities rather than just dump and run. <clears throat> what, what is their? I, I'm confused as what their rush is and, and why they wouldn't work with us on a schedule rather than just saying, "This is our schedule. Are you with us or not?" Number one, I think they want to dump and run. Number two, I don't, I've don't. i never presented them with an alternative schedule. Uh, um, if we want to present them, I, I'd be happy to do that. I think that the timing is not going to work. I don't know, I don't know how receptive they'll be they, to it, but. But they also need to understand that we have the, we have the right to refuse the purpose of the, of, 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 of the land. And this is a zoning issue. We have the right to. It needs to be a an allowable use of right. zoning. Right. right. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we have the right to purchase the property at the terms that they find uh, on the terms and conditions that they find with another purchaser. Can I can I ask this? Oh. Do you do you feel like this is kind of is going? I think last time we, we talked, we wanted somehow to work with them when they came and talked to us. We would work with you together to to make this happen. Yep. Um, do you feel like the working together part is happening? 
Because I just yes. having two separate RSPs doesn't necessarily mean you're not working together. Yes, we. Yes, but, but then the question. Okay, they so have. They have been. They have been cooperative. Oh, um, okay. They understand the challenges associated with both lots and how and how they're intertwined, mm -hmm. um, for sure. Um, but so, again, so they are but, cooperating. But we, our interests are, are slightly different. Yeah. They want to get out from under, from a liability, from mm -hmm. a financial liability. We want to make sure that whatever whatever the next use or whatever the next use of that lot is is appropriate for the neighborhood and it's best for the town. <clears throat> um, yeah. I just I just have so, a hard time believing they're gonna sell that lot mm -hmm. on its own. With the well, I don't think that uh, I don't um, think that's what they're trying to do. It, she it, says that they're working together. And I take him at his word that this having separate RFPs is not an indication I, I, that I, the school I, is trying to, to I get it, but move if they move, if, if they move forward on just they're moving forward on just their law. No, I don't think just, so. Yeah, that's the sense I get. Uh, yeah. they haven't said that. I haven't asked them to alter their schedule yet. Um, but I our schedule that question. But our schedule is mm -hmm. going to be impacted by that then. Because if, if our schedule says, let, let's say our schedule says we're going to look at an annual town meeting. Yep. Those schedules are, are, are not in sync, that's all I'm saying. And then, mm -hmm. yes, that's correct. And then they'll have to decide whether they're okay. And, but then a buyer, a prospective buyer is rolling the dice. Well, we, but we brought up that, and I remember talking about annual town meeting, waiting until annual town meeting. Remember when they proposed their schedule of doing this in December? And I said, well, we may want to wait till annual town meeting, and they, they didn't respond. It's like they didn't care whether we waited for town meeting or not. It's the reaction I got, right? They wanted to proceed. Well, they, they, their, interest in, yeah. their interest is in getting out front of the property. Yeah. From their financial liability, yeah. it is right. quick as reasonably possible. Well, can we have a schedule where the RFPs go out as soon as possible, but the timeline is such that we make our decision at the annual town meeting? I mean, uh, I think it'd be really. I mean, we're asking, we're asking. Well, it's a really small risk, I think, and we, that we're going to have somebody who, who needs to know before then. We'd be asking a bidder to hold open an offer for for a period of time, maybe 120 days, and maybe they are, maybe they're not. I mean, it I, took, I don't like, think it took are going to knock down the door to, to, to like drop off bids. It took six years to sell this building. I don't think four months right. is going to be a problem. It's not like the demand of the corner of Christian Lane and River Road in Wheatley right. is this. Yeah. We're, not talking, we're not talking, you know, 35th and Broadway here. I don't like this term, but it's going to take the right buyer. <laughs> there aren't that many vacant parcels for All right. Yeah. Residential in town. I, I, I think the so, first step is we can buy these RFPs. Uh, and we'll check on that. It, but the and second step quickly is going to, I'm going to get asked the question of what about getting this out? Right. Show us the schedule. Yeah. The schedule there's a hypothetical. The schedule they'll show us is, is, is the, the RFP. Well, their RFP goes out October, end of yeah, October. That's what Brian is saying. That's their schedule. Right. But they, they, that doesn't sound like cooperation then. You, you well, I, have, I haven't asked anything different about okay. that. So, so, so the question is, do you want me to ask them differently? Uh, yes, I'd like to see if they'll put out a joint RFP if it's allowed. And short of that, can, can we agree we, on an alternative schedule? Can we talk about the schedule? Okay. To maximize the return on this. And to accommodate our town, annual town meeting? Yeah. Okay. I mean, they're, they're probably in January, probably after the holidays. Right, there are politics involved here, and they have to understand that. Okay, is that what we agreed yeah. to as a board? Yeah, yeah. 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 Agree with that? Okay. You know that, Janet? I don't feel as strongly about it as Sean does, but I, I mean, I don't think it's a big risk to put it out earlier, honestly. Yeah, but I, right, but. I do think there's good arguments to be made that it really should be an annual town meeting than a special. If it were going to be a special, we'd really have to make it a very special special, you know? Okay. And, and that that's kind of hard to put into an RFP. Okay. You know? Okay, okay uh, moving on, let's go back to our, our 6.30 schedule appointment. Zach, you going to provide us an update yeah. on, on, up on skims? Uh, John, everybody, come on up. Where's the best place for me? 
Right there is fine. Okay. Oh, that's yeah, that's yeah. Good. somewhere in net row is good. To accommodate the camera there. Get our own four numbers if you want to do do we, do we post this GEMS meeting? No, this is just kidding. I know it's not a question. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Zachary Smith. I'm the director of South County EMS. Uh, and I was asked to be here to kind of give an update. We have our regular BOO meetings, which is the Board of Oversight. That's the group that oversees South County EMS. And they're comprised of uh, two voting members each of the three towns that comprises our department. So Waitley, um, Sunderland, and Deerfield. And uh, Deerfield's a fiscal agency. They have an additional non-voting member on the board. But that meeting happens typically the third Thursday of the month. And we have it at the South Deerfield, sorry, the Sunderland Public Safety Complex. Um, there's a meeting room back. And those are open meetings, uh, 6 p.m. And they're posted uh, in all three towns. So I encourage anybody to come to those meetings who wants to participate or hear regular updates. Um, I'm here tonight, uh, kind of give my Waitley perspective, my Waitley spiel, and to answer any questions anybody might have about um, what our department's doing. Um, so uh, real quick, the background for people who don't know, we're a 24-7 paramedic service, uh, which means that we have paramedics advanced level uh, advanced life support level care. Uh, they go to school for two and a half to three years and they staff an ambulance 24 7 and that ambulance is currently staffed in the South Deerfield Fire District building and you call 911 and we are your ambulance. Uh, we do about a thousand calls a year. That's been going up about 10% every year since our inception uh, which was July of 2014 and uh, the busiest times of the day for ambulance calls for us um, are during the day. That's because we have a lot of people that come to our community that either work or they shop or they drive through. So during the day between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. we actually add one additional staff member plus myself uh, during the weekdays it means that we can actually staff two ambulances during our busiest times. Um, and as a result we uh, cover the majority of our calls. Actually, our primary ambulance covers 92% of our calls, um, and then the residual, about 7.5%, um, are covered by that second ambulance or our local call staff and volunteers um, who get dispatched when we have calls in the area. Uh, and then if all of our resources are depleted, then we call on our neighbors for mutual aid. So that would be either Medicare out of Greenfield, uh, Northampton, Hatfield, um, or even Conway Ambulance. They've, they've responded in the past to uh, back us up just as we back them up uh, when they're very busy. So, uh, any questions so far? I That's kind of a, sure got my numbers right. Yeah. So about 92% are first ambulance goes. Yeah. Out to about yeah. 7% our second ambulance can go out to. We don't have really a third ambulance per se that's staffed up. Yeah. Uh, one of you guys. <laughs> so oh. something like one percent or less uh, are mutual aid from other towns. Yeah. Uh, so you know, I have to the. I tried to run those numbers specifically on mutual aid um, for tonight. So it's uh, more like one percent ish. I, it, it's it would even be less. It's difficult for us to track those numbers specifically because we have a regional dispatch center. We don't do our own dispatching. Um, the majority of the time, a local responder will, will go to a scene. So even if all three of our ambulances are busy on calls and we get a fourth call, typically a local responder will be able to get on scene. Um, all the local police departments are always dispatched, and we try to dispatch the fire departments as well as first response agencies. Um, so when you mentioned first ambulance, second ambulance, and now you said third ambulance, it's, the third ambulance, we don't necessarily have the staff for three ambulances at any given time. Sure, but yeah. it's possible that when there's a lot of people, there could be. Yeah, so for that exactly. thousand calls we do a year, we need two ambulances to do those thousand calls. Um, what that means is if an ambulance is getting its yearly vehicle inspection or its yearly state inspection or needs preventative maintenance or something like that and it's out of service, that third ambulance can then maintain a two ambulance fleet. Uh, that third ambulance we actually also use for outreach. So next, uh, next week we're going to go do the Girl Scout troop uh, in Deerfield. Part of their requirement is to have us come by. We do the Frontier football games as well. We do some science and technology fairs at the elementary school. So we can send that third ambulance mm -hmm. with our crews and still maintain two ambulances for emergency. So you might hear me refer to a third ambulance 
um, here and there, but it's not typically part of our normal response scheme. Can I ask you a question? You said, well, okay, when the first ambulance goes out, okay, the second one is, is that fully staffed, ready to go out, or is that just waiting on call? So we have, during those busy hours at 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., yeah. it is staffed. We have somebody at the station physically in the ambulance who's being paid to be there. The second one? The second ambulance, yeah. The second is fully staffed, ready to go? Outside of those hours, we do have on-call personnel, and those are local EMTs um, and paramedics. Uh, or we, we are constantly recruiting, and they actually get paid $8 an hour to be available. When the first ambulance goes out, they travel to the location of the second ambulance, and they staff that second ambulance so it is available if we need it. Um, the downside of that is that is dependent on the local EMT's availability um, and, and their presence, and so there's not total coverage with that, um, but we have some consistent people who do sign up for shifts, typically on the overnights, when they, when they know they're gonna be home and not at work. But is that just between 10 and six, or is that? That is all times other than 10 and six. So from 6 p.m. to 10 a.m., we have that on-call sign up. Okay, what's, what's happening? It may be said from 10 to six for the second ambulance, is that? Fully staffed, ready to go uh, at the station? We have at least one person staffed in the ambulance at the station from 10 to 6. During Monday through Friday, uh, when I'm around, I comprise that second member on that crew. So that is a fully staffed ambulance during those times, okay. assuming I'm not someplace else or anything like that. Um, and then that ambulance is also staffed, can be staffed during the day by our local on call as well. So they're free and welcome to respond on the ambulance calls to um, provide their care. That's not holidays or weekends. Yes, that, that's supposed to be my question. For weekends, Saturdays and Sundays is like the 6 to 10. It's staffed, but the second ambulance is by on call. Uh, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., even on Saturday and Sunday, oh. we have that extra impact shift person. Oh, um, okay. We don't see a precipitous drop off on calls on the weekends. I mean, we're consistent all the way through. So we, main, oh, okay. we maintain that staffing for consistency seven days a week. And that includes holidays. That includes holidays. Right. Yep. Yep. 365, seven days a week. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah. That was a good primer because I, I knew this stuff three years ago. Yeah. It just reminded me of all the stuff that I used to know. It is, uh, we have quite a complex staffing model. It's, it's rather unique. Most locations are either all volunteer, all call staff, or all full time. So we're very unique in that, that um, melting of those two to, to maintain that. And, and that was something that we had, we had worked very hard to yeah. maintain was that volunteerism that had worked. Right uh, in the past, but to, to marry the volunteerism, right with with permanent paid staff, was something that we really worked hard to make sure that we could we could have a, have that collaborative yeah. staff. Yeah, yeah, very hard, and and that's uh, that's a tall graph too, um, because just as the department, as we advance in technology and level of training and things like that, the requirements from the state in order to maintain everybody's level of training and expertise every year uh, keeps growing. So yeah, we, we spend a lot of effort just making sure that um, everybody on our roster is kept up to speed and kept in the fold. So the paramedic level is only on the first ambulance? Uh, no, it, it is also on the second ambulance, um, presuming we have a paramedic available, which is the vast majority of the time. This is where it gets a little confusing. When I'm around, I'm a paramedic, so that second ambulance is a paramedic. Um, when that impact shift person is on duty and they're a paramedic, it's a paramedic level truck. Um, because we try to, that, that second person during the day, that's really where we lean on our local responders and we keep them involved and we keep them busy in their community. So some of those people are EMT basics and I'm not going to prohibit them from giving back to their community. So they may staff an ambulance 10 to 6. Um, but we try to marry them up with like myself, so we maintain that paramedic level. So if they're out on a call with a second ambulance and you need a paramedic level assistance, you have to wait for a mutual aid to come? Uh, uh, yes, I, it would be, they would have a crew, they would be able to transport to the hospital immediately, which is really how we measure life saved, is immediate transport, and the paramedic crew, if we needed them, if we didn't have our own, would meet them, intercept them, en route to the hospital. 
So we wouldn't have to wait for that crew to come all the way from Northampton or Greenfield. We could meet them on the Deerfield Greenfield line or, or something like that. Okay, how often does that happen? Very rarely. Um, very rarely. I don't have, that's a great question. Um, I honestly can't remember the last time we required an intercept. It's... Monday morning? Well, that was a mutual aid call. That was a mutual aid call. Um, now you had one on Christian Lane a couple months ago. Where we needed an intercept? <coughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I know I, the mutual aid and the intercept is a little bit different. I, you know, it's the, the mutual aid implies that we weren't able to staff an ambulance for whatever reason. The intercept is that we had an ambulance that was transporting. The, talk a little bit about the average response times to sure. in, in, in Waitley. Sure. Um, because those numbers, there are always going to be exceptions, which we should always work to mitigate. Yeah. Um, but talk a little bit about the, the response times. Sure. So uh, I just ran these numbers for our inception to yesterday, so as much data as possible. Um, our average response time department-wide is 7 minutes, 7 seconds. So for all calls that our department does, 7 minutes, 7 seconds. Um, that's from when we get dispatched to when we arrive at the patient side. For Waitley specifically, it's 7 minutes, 50 seconds. So a difference of 43 seconds, and that's mainly attributable just to the distance and the rural nature of West Waitley and, and things like that. That was um, average, you said. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other way to measure it is um, uh, fractal response times. You might hear that if you're, if you're doing some research. So we measure that 90th percentile fractal response times. What does that mean? It means that the 90 percent of our calls um, fall under a certain time. So our 90th fractal response time department-wide is 12 minutes. That means that 90% of our calls, they see an ambulance within 12 minutes, which is that national standard. And that includes times where our crew might be returning from Cooley Dickinson Hospital and they're in Hatfield, um, or things like that that might delay them otherwise. Uh, for, so that's 12 minutes department-wide. For Waitley, it's 14. So 14 minutes is our 90th uh, percentile. Um, I didn't run a geo map of all of our locations that we respond to in Waitley, um, like a uh, a heat map, if you will, about where the majority of our calls are, but Waitley doesn't really have a, a town center, so to speak, or a real dense area. Our calls are pretty diffuse over the, the, total, the totality of the town of Waitley, so some of those response times are just longer by the nature of having to travel out there. But still pretty, pretty impressive response time. Uh, it, in it, yeah, um, incredibly impressive, I'd say. Um, how many total runs in Waitley since inception and also just in 2017? Um, glad you asked. Uh, uh, in, since inception, 412. Um, and that's out of 2,946 the department made. Um, so right around that 12 or 13 percent, I think it is. For year to date for 2017, so January 1st, uh, we've done 116 calls in Waitley. And that's actually up 11% from last year, same time span. Um, so that's pretty consistent. We're seeing between a 9 and 11% increase across all of our metrics, both department-wide and even just weekly. Um, so for 2017 year-to-date, 116 responses. Uh, what's the total? Um, 798. Uh, you also have a higher percentage of um, acute life support calls, ALS calls, requiring paramedics. Um, so your percentage is, this is total, is 58% of the calls that we do in Waitley require some sort of paramedic intervention, um, compared to 52% department-wide. Why is that? I, I mainly attribute that just to the type of community you are. So your your community people live here, they're hardy workers, they work on a farm, they're less likely to call 911 unless they feel that they truly need that ambulance. Versus a community such as um, Deerfield with a lot of traffic, we get a lot of car accidents, things like that where somebody might call 911 on behalf of somebody else, they see a car accident, their fender benders are relatively minor injuries or no injuries at all. So I think that's why we see a higher percentage um, for paramedic level calls in Wake. But is there also, 
some correlation between ALS calls and uh, a, a more aging population? Uh, sure, uh, yeah, absolutely. So as, as we age, we get more complex health conditions um, or comorbidities, so something that might be relatively simple coupled with something else relatively simple makes a complex patient. So absolutely. Because Waitley, certainly, Waitley does not have as many young people Correct. in town yes. than Sunderland and Deerfield. Correct, correct. Um, and you know, on the flip side of that, we talk about refusals, which is where we actually assess a patient. We might even uh, render some aid and they decide they don't want to be transported to the hospital, which is their right. 15% um, of the calls in Waitley we do are refusals. That's, that's kind of typical, somewhere around that, that range. Um, and for department-wide, it's 19. And again, I think it's kind of, it's just the inverse of that paramedic level ALS thing, where sicker patients um, and kind of waiting to call 911 uh, in general, so. Um, so. So with those numbers, would it, it would, there's just, that we can't do it around. If we had 116 calls in Waitley and our 90% of calls are responded to in less than 14 minutes, so we should expect in, it's almost a year, um, uh, something like 10 to 12 of those calls took more than 14 minutes. I, you know, is there, I, is there in, uh, on average? But so when a call takes more than fourteen minutes, is that a and then, so then those numbers yeah. are your response, not necessarily the mutual aid's response time. So Correct. And and the thing with these numbers is these numbers make great talking points. They great, make great metrics. Sometimes when we start drilling in, we get really into the weeds. So right, some yeah. of those longer response times, when we measure from time of tone to actual time at the patient's side, we might have actually arrived on scene in five minutes, but because of the nature of the call, we're waiting for the police to you know, go in and make sure that the scene is safe or something like oh, that. Okay. So we might actually be parked around the corner five minutes, 10 minutes, waiting to make sure that it's safe for our personnel to enter or something like that. That would disproportionately inflate that response time, which would then affect our- so That can't be a frequent occurrence. It is waiting not- around the corner for the police to- a few times a month, depending on the nature of the call. If, if based on the way that calls are dispatched, if there is a domestic, yeah, if there's a certain likelihood that there it might be a dangerous situation, then we always err on safety and, and we do that. So it's that's not unusual. Um, so you know, it's for mutual aid calls. Yeah. Um, do we have any? I mean, it's a small number, it's like 1% of. Yeah. Time. But do we have any numbers on what a response time is likely to be when we're calling for mutual aid? I, I don't keep those numbers just because we don't have a dispatch center, we don't dispatch them. I think kind of shooting from the hip, high teens, low 20s typically for a response. We go to mutual aid when we know that we're not gonna get a crew. So what would happen is they tone us out, our crews, um, and then usually at that three or five minute mark, which is protocol, they, they would, if they haven't heard from anybody, that's when they start mutually. Um, and that process can take some time. And that's, that's a phone call the dispatcher makes to another center. They tone out their crews. They have to respond and they're further away. So, um, um, those- It's one of those, like, it's about like a three minute delay per, place you have to contact and so on? I, yeah, so you know, let's say, we'll estimate high, right? So five minutes for them to call, you got another minute and a half, two minutes for them to get in the ambulance and start responding, so there's seven, and then say it's Northampton, travel time up 91, lights and sirens, so maybe another seven minutes, give or take, we'll say 10 even, you know, at the high end. So now we're talking about 17 minutes for that paramedic to arrive um, at your door. So who else is dispatched during that time? Uh, immediate, the protocol normally is that the, we're dispatched and the, on the police side, if there's a police officer on duty, they're made aware of the call. And nine times out of 10, if, if they're not doing anything, they will respond as well as a first responder. Um, it's not unusual actually for our crews to beat the police now um, because of our response times. Uh, Depending on the nature of the call, um, other, like the fire department may, may be dispatched, specifically if we think there might be a need for them. Car accidents are a great um, example of that. If we need scene control because of traffic, we need a fire apparatus to help make the scene safe on the highway. If there's fluids, if there's a, a concern for fire, something like that. We've also been working, uh, John, 
John Hanneman, the uh, fire chief in Waitley, and I have been working with our shelter control dispatch center to make sure that his department is dispatched as well, especially if we know there's going to be a mutual aid ambulance coming in or something like that, so we can get those first responders there before the ambulance arrives, before that 14 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever it may be. Um, we've had some difficulty kind of getting some traction on that. We're trying to figure out where that problem is, my personnel know to request those resources and ask for those resources um, at just at, as, at, I want to say as protocol, um, but that's assuming that they're aware and available. Um, you know, just recently I had my crew dealing with a truly sick critical patient and they were too focused on that patient in order to be listening to the radio or trying to do a dispatcher's job or something like that. But when available, you know, we try to kind of help each other out and scratch each of the back and remind each other, you know, how to, you know, what we should be doing. So, so I guess my question, because in my 14 years or whatever I've been here doing this thing, I think that the creation of scams is is easily one of the best moves that Whitley's done, perhaps the best move um, that we've done in since 2004, um, as far back as I go. But obviously stuff happens, and, and I, I guess I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask about the specifics of this past Monday yeah. when the second ambulance apparently didn't, wasn't able to respond for whatever reason. Yeah. I'm wondering if you have some anecdotal qualitative sure. information on why that delay of 35 minutes took place. Yeah, so this was uh, this was a call that occurred at 9-11 a.m. I know that uh, Chief Hannum called me. I heard, uh, I heard it dispatched. I was out of town. Chief Hannum called me the following day asking that very same question. Okay, what happened here? Um, at 8, I pulled the dispatch log. I called the dispatch center to uh, see if I could get their story on it, try to anticipate these questions. At 8.50, our primary ambulance, our 24-7 paramedics, were dispatched to that critically ill patient um, in another community. Uh, so our primary ambulance went to mutual aid somewhere else? Well, no, to, no, actually, it was in Deerfield. I, so oh, I, I didn't mean to imply, that? yes. Okay. So, so that person called 911 at 8.50 um, or 8.47 or something like that, and they got that, that ambulance. Um, not to change the argument or anything like that, but they saved that person's life that day. Uh, that happened at 8.50. At 9.11, we got a simultaneous call dispatched in the town of Wakeley on Christian Lane, the call in question. So on Christian Lane. Christian Lane? Oh, sorry. No. I'm sorry. I'm thinking I'm Long Glen Road. Long Lane. San, what? Sandy Lane, Long Glen Road. Right. Yes, sorry. I was I was thinking about the previous conversation in this room and I Right. That's sorry, confused me. Um they toned out for the second crew. Uh, my impact shift person, a, a highly experienced paramedic, was coming in at 10 a.m. Um, he's our crews typically arrive to the station a half an hour before their shift, so they can be ready. Um, but this happened at 9:11 a.m. So right before my impact tr crew was coming on, and we did not have any local EMTs signed up for that morning shift. I think it runs six to ten. Um, as on call. So nobody was signed up, but they tone it out because sometimes people say, I can't sign up, I don't want to commit myself because who knows what's going to happen with the kid or the school bus, but if there's a call, I can still respond if it comes in. So they toned it out, and at that, from what I could discern from the dispatch ticket was they toned it out, there were no response from the local EMTs, and so at the, and they dispatched the police department at the same at the same moment. So the police officer was en route as a first responder. At about the three or five minute mark, it wasn't entirely clear from the dispatch log. They, it was determined that, okay, there's no, South County is not responding. Um, their primary ambulance is busy on a call. Nobody on call has signed on the air. And that's when they started the mutual aid process. Um, the dispatch log, and John, if you have information that you heard, Please help me. But All I remember is what I did, Zach. I heard South County get dispatched the second time, and then yeah. there was nobody on it. And I said, I need to get in the middle of this. Sure. And I called dispatch and asked them if they had any first responders going, and they said no. So I asked them to tone wait and fire. I right. asked them. Correct. Yeah. Nobody from shelter control is supposed to be noted. There's supposed to be notes on the board up there. Yeah. And 
My question is, who is your first backup on that, on that protocol? Who would they call first? Yeah, our mutual aid protocol should have been Northampton. Is my understanding. So why was Hatfield there? And so I don't know. I don't know yet. So they ended up sending both Northampton and Hatfield. So two ambulances were dispatched, and they were both at the paramedic level that day, right? Well, Hatfield's not a paramedic truck. Oh, I'm sorry. And then I misunderstood. They're intermediate, okay. right? Yeah, they're still an intermediate truck. They didn't have their drugs on. They've applied for their license. Okay. Within so, the next few days or so, they're supposed to so get So they their dispatched drugs. two ambulances, and the first to arrive was... It was 35 yeah. minutes. I, I got 35 minutes. Okay. It was quarter. Okay. Um, so I, I guess my question would be, and this is probably a conversation to have with the full board of oversight as well. Yeah. Because they're responsible for staffing. Um, when there's no backup scheduled from the volunteer, Mm -hmm. from that 6 p.m. to 10 a.m., yeah. and, and you, you didn't have anyone scheduled, shouldn't Shelburne Control have direction to automatically, they can tone out to the, to the wait lead volunteers yeah. who may be waiting, yeah. but they didn't sign up. Yeah. So wouldn't it make sense to tone, and I may not be using the right language here, tone out to the Whitley volunteers, but also automatically tone out to mutual aid. Right, immediately. Immediately, and, and not yeah. wait that five minutes. Yeah, right, so this is right. So that's that's one of those options. We can look at um, the staffing, whether we move or extend that impact shifts. Right, there's, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's, there's still a percentage of calls that are going to mutual aid. And as three communities, as a board of oversight, we need to figure out you know, where, where do we draw that line in the sand? Um, right. We would, right, I, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, we would expect probably some amount of mutual aid. I think 35 minutes is way too long, if that's how long it took. That's took here. Right, exactly. Right. So, I, but right, so, so yeah. that's, that would be my recommendation yeah, for right. the Board of Oversight, and, and I don't know whether that would be a, your decision as, as, as the director or a, a, a boo decision, and, and that's something we can discuss. Right. But, it also should be pointed out that the that there's always been some frequency of calls that took far too long to respond to, um, and, and I and I just want people to understand that the frequency of those delayed response times has dropped dramatically since here. It doesn't mean that we should be fixing yeah. and and working to get better and better at what we do because this isn't a, a, a good situation. Right. Um, and it's, and it's uh, you know, an example of what we used as our examples to, 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 to create South County EMS to begin with. So I think that is a fix that could happen, but the frequency of these types of, of, of delays has dropped dramatically because of the, situ the, the staffing system that, that you've yeah. implemented. But we should fix it, we well, should get better. Yes, well, you're absolutely right. And I think it's even just remarkable that this is standing out so much. I mean, there was a time, I remember even, that it's like, yeah, well, that's, that's what you get. You get 30 minutes for an ambulance because we live in a rural community and our ambulances are coming from Greenfield or, or Northampton. So yeah, the, the, we, it needs to be addressed when you figure out what's going on. I, I, I'm glad we've made as much headway as we Because I, I can't imagine, I mean, this is, as the crow flies, two miles from South Deerfield Fire District. Yep. Um, where the ambulances are housed, the backup ambulance. I assume the backup ambulance was there that day? Uh, no, the backup ambulance would current, that would be, ambulance in would be in Sutherland at that moment. Okay, but, but still. Still. Yep. As the crow flies, that's not very far. Correct. So I, I just can't help but think. If we, if, if this were had been in West Whaley, mm -hmm. that that makes the response potentially even longer. Although if they came from Hatfield, it's the other way. Yeah, it's the other way because the polls are in North Hampton. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, yeah. it's, it's you sort of. I think it's a personnel you know, John, John, I think it's a personnel issue, and there was nobody scheduled to order. Yeah. Or there was nobody on that scheduled to be on the backup truck. Right. But, but, I, Gary, you had something else. Yeah, um, well, it's a question for Zach. Uh, do you do any tracking as far as that second ambulance getting toned and not 
having a crew respond? Do you track any of that? Um, so, any percentage wise? Again, right, we're getting into the weeds here. Um, year to date this year, I've I was able to find six instances year to date from January first that the call was labeled as treated and transferred care. Imply that's our language to say that our units responded, they started treatment, and for whatever reason they were unable to complete that transport to the hospital. I have to read those individual reports to figure out whether it was they transferred it to a helicopter and that's why they didn't do it, or whether it was because they didn't have a crew or something like that. Um, well, that's what I'm wondering yeah. about not getting there. a crew together at all. Yeah. Because that's, that's what I'm thinking, kind of what Jonathan so had not said. not get a crew together at all. Um, for the second meeting. Yeah, for, uh, it was uh, calendar year 2016, I, request, I requested this information from Shelburne Control, which is our regional dispatch center, and I said, hey, can you just run a, run a report, tell me how many times um, South County EMS didn't respond, but we got mutual instead. Um, and we can't do that. They started laughing. You know what I got? <laughs> I got a 500 page printout of every single call and right. the narrative description total. and said, these are all of your calls. You can read the descriptions. Yeah. yeah. Um, That's good software. So, uh, <laughs> don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> so I, you're right, Gary, this is, this is information we need data that it's going to be time consuming, but we can gather, we can put it together and kind of figure out, you know, where are those shortcomings and yeah, how we get time are those shortcomings? Yeah, because right. to get to John's point, and I and you know, there was no staffing, but don't get sick between don't, nine you know, and ten. Right, but but if it had been two a.m. in the morning, the same thing possibly could have happened rather than nine o'clock. Right, again. or it would have been less likely that that nine fifty call came in. You know, I, I'm just, like, but yeah, but if, if you're going to increase your staffing, then you get into the gray area of where do you no longer have paid backup sitting there waiting, not on call, but mm -hmm. sitting in that, yeah. I can't do my math, in that 16 hour period of time? Yeah, 16, yep. That we're not staff, is it is 14, is it 12? Right. Is right. It, and that's not a bad question, we should know. But that's why, to Gary's question, we should know mm -hmm. the frequency of that, set, or maybe yeah. it was Joyce, the, the frequency of that second mm -hmm. call Set payments not being available and the times that that was yeah available. so I, I came at this the opposite way so I ran the numbers to see how many times and at what frequencies ambulance two and ambulance three were utilized and that's where we got our busy we can track hours a day so instead of instead of extrapolating when did we have to go to mutual aid I extrapolated when did we use our additional resources and that's how we came to that ten to six time. Um, the data is there, we can find it. You know, this is that big age old question. All, all of our towns could staff a full time fire department and never have to request mutual aid at a structure fire. But we'd all say, well, no, we'd rely on, why would you do that? Or we could not have any fire department at all and everything just burned down and you would say, why would you do that? This is in California. Right. <laughs> so the deal is, you know, right, exactly. Asking these questions, getting the data, and figuring out where in between those two extremes the department needs to be in order to serve the community. Well, even, even trying to, you know, kind of like what Jonathan said is, you know, start the mutual aid sooner. Yeah. Um, why couldn't they, you know, instead of waiting their three to five minutes and nobody shows up for that second right. ambulance, right. why not, when they first tone that second ambulance, also tone the mutual aid right. at the same time? Right. I mean, they tone the police, right? Yep. Automatically. Yeah, so why not automatically yeah. start the mutual aid? Because yeah. you know we're going to get a volunteer town yeah. from Hatfield or something yeah. who's There's no not going to schedule. Then right. And if they don't have anybody on the schedule, it's going to take that extra five minutes. There's, so now you're up to right. you know you're losing Shelburne, that much there's more time. Or not anybody on the schedule. Uh, the Shelburne Shelburne Control doesn't have access, nor do the dispatchers want to well, look at our schedule. Um, so who knows in advance? I mean, the on-duty crew, I mean, they, they... Whoever's in charge that night, whoever the emergency... Yes, yeah, media. right. Yeah, whoever this, whoever the staff but, but is. But that's a call that someone in his office could make to shelter and control. The other problem is there's nobody there when that ambulance is saving a life going to Springfield. They're in the back of the truck, saving a life. There's nobody else to call. 
So what does shelter control do? Call mutual aid? They call mutual aid. That's their protocol. Right. But nobody's making a, a call. It. it takes them a while. Am I right? When Gary's in the back of the ambulance doing what he does best, there's nobody babysitting, for a better word, three times. During that and your service. At, during that 16 hour period of time. No, when just when he's in the back of the truck doing a call. His mind is worried about that patient and taking care of this patient that's gonna die if he doesn't take care of him. Right. And there's nobody taking care of South Deerfield, Sunderland, and Whaley in EMS. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean my right? understanding is Shelburne Control or Regional Dispatch Center is aware of what units are where and, and how they're mm -hmm. tied up and, and, and things like that, and that they would follow protocols. Exactly, and, that's what they're there for. I understand right, that. Right. I, I mean, that's, that's who's babysitting the towns right. when we're saving a life in the back of the ambulance. How, how much advance notice do you know if somebody is signing up for your evening hours. I mean, is, do they have to do it within 24 hours of that? Or we sign up six weeks in advance. We know whether somebody's signing up on call. I, I don't know who just returned to town from their vacation and wants to go on a call, or I don't know who, you but know. If no one's, but if no one's signed up, then you, uh, it, it just is a call to Shelburne Control saying, initiate mutual aid on second time, right? Yeah. And they'll say, okay. Yeah. And then more than one responder yeah. shows up. Oh well, so be it. Yeah. All right. We can always cancel mutual aid. Um, if there's, I, yeah. I, I, if if the opposite happened, if we were dispatched to Conway every time they went to it, or Greenfield every time, we'd, get sent home sometimes. We, we'd never be in town. You know, we'd, we'd be on Deerfield Street in Greenfield right. twenty four seven. But shame on us for, for turning away, for, for, for turning our backs on people. Yeah. Need help. Uh, right. So I, mean, I think this. I mean, this certainly there are a lot of options and a lot of avenues we yeah. can right. we it can would, approach. It, would, it might be wasteful. You're saying is what I'm hearing to uh, go so quickly to mutual aid before we're sure the local resources are. I don't want to give the impression that I'm, I'm discounting that idea yeah. at all. I just that there's, there's, there's a bigger picture that we are one EMS agency within the area that right. we have to kind of... No, we should talk about it in a movie. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, you it's not like you're calling that mutual aid for every call. Right. You're only calling it if there's a simultaneous call. You know, right. that first yeah. ambulance yeah. is out. That's right. the only time you call it. And how often yeah. does that happen? I mean, it's... Well, if it's... If it's only for the simultaneous calls when there isn't an impact shift on, it's... You said it's 1%. Yeah, I mean, it, we're talking, yeah, very rarely. And so, but to that 1% so so person, to aid, right, that's what we feel. Yeah, right. Yeah. As long as it's not me or you. Well, well right, then, then, yeah. Yeah. right, so just saying. But, the hard yeah. is that if every town does yeah. that, then every town's going to be running out to mutual aid all the time. There's a, sol there's a solution back. in here. Yeah, yeah. we just have to look at the let's, let's put it on the, or ask Bobby if he'll put it on the agenda sure. for next meeting. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it on the agenda. Let me, let me just say, <laughs> however you want to do it. <laughs> let me just say that's something you need to look at is getting the, the after hours uh, sign up sheets and making sure coverage is there because people under the, under the the notion that this is 24 seven and if they call, they're gonna be there within you say seven minutes. Mm -hmm. I've had people this week tell me, we saw two ambulances go up and down Christian Lane. What's going on? People are looking, people are seeing mutual aid ambulances going in town and they're wondering why we're paying to, to do South County EMS. So I guess my point is there's people in town looking at that, considering yeah. that. And if they're gonna want something during the, them hours, I guess you, you need to look at how to be prepared to answer 99% of the calls, not just the 85% or, or whatever. No, I, I no but he is responding to 99%. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, no, I, but, but, but we can't, we also, Fred, but, all due respect to people in town, we can't run our ambulance strictly on anecdotal commentary. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's important, qualitative stuff is important, but the data speaks volumes. It is, not, it is 99 percent and that's data that's not that's irrefutable data i know but there's still the one percent that i get you know, it and that one percent yeah, is yeah it's, 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 we, it, i'd be happy to staff enough ambulances that we never have to go to mutual aid but there'd be a cost I, you know and it, this is this is a question for what what do the people want i mean we built south county around a model that the people voted and said that this is what feels like a good ratio of, of coverage to expense looks like. Um, and, and this is medicine, right? I mean, we talk about when do we start mammograms? When do we start prostate exams? You know, this is all, 
Are we going to miss some people? Absolutely, and we have to figure out as a society, you know, where do we want those parameters? Because stacking that additional 16 hours a day, seven days a week, with the equivalent of you, is going to add hundred thousand dollars to the budget problem. Uh, you need. I mean, you're talking about a f basically a full other truck. If, yeah. if, so and and that's six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars with benefits for you know for those. So I fell short on my. That's yeah. Uh, you were but, short. <laughs> uh, you know, but but it, okay, but you know, if if it's just one person, and then you say, okay, we're not going to lean so heavily on the call staff, and we're going to lean half as heavily, just one person, then you know, four hundred thousand, three hundred thousand. Right. Yeah, so like, right. Yeah. Um, okay. But the mammogram analogy is a great one. Actually, we make those decisions with healthcare. On when you start doing these things, and you and you miss people. Yeah, and you, and you the, the ten to six thing. Of, uh, I know you said you got statistics that show that's a certain percent of your calls, and that's an eight-hour shift. If you look, maybe and you look at ten-hour shift, at four days yeah. rather than the five-day one. To, you know, to cover the two hours, maybe the two hours in the morning, or even an hour longer in the evening, yeah. would cover most of that one percent that you're missing. Mm -hmm. And we can talk with them in our staffing yeah. conversations yeah. at Boom yeah. Meetings. Yeah, they appreciate so. <laughs> We're not asking you to work in those out. Yeah. No. <laughs> and, and honestly, as a, as a, as a scientist and engineer, I really appreciate that you use data. I and love evidence-based yeah, medicine. When, yeah. <laughs> but when, when, when is it, we, we have something we call anic data, and which is like, this is what we think is the data should be from the story I heard. Um, which isn't really data, so I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. Okay, any other comments? Anybody else on uh, skims? Did you have anything else to, you want to talk about? Uh, it's, it's all stuff about outreach, the Girl Scouts we talked about. We're doing a, a Bay State uh, MCI drill uh, next week, so we're coordinating with the hospital. If, God forbid we ever had a large incident, and they're training and we're training with them, so we'll be able to interface and our staff will recognize each other. Um, that's coming up. Um, and I uh, tra uh, trained and met with your Yankee Candle Code 1 team, uh, which is your, uh, at Yankee Candle, at all their facilities, they have a first aid squad. Um, and so I met with them, I coordinated with their nurse over there, and they've seen our equipment. Um, they know how we work, our staff has met with them, and um, they're always outstanding, and that's, you know, we talk about response times. If it's seven minutes, 50 seconds, a response time in Waitley, well, if I'm going to Yankee Candle, it's actually about a minute, because that's how long it takes for their local um, first aid team to respond, who have been oriented and trained by us, so that's, that's good stuff. Well, Will is getting their money's worth. It's a, it's a great thing. Uh, I'm, under the impression, I'm under the impression uh, that the money in the ambulance service is in transport. And I'm wondering if we're looking into the future to uh, diminish the cost of the towns by going to a more commercial operation. Um, so there, there are for-profit agencies, ambulance agencies, that just do like inter-facility transfers. So they're not emergency calls. Um, and you can theoretically make money doing that because you know when that call is going to come in. Somebody schedules that, that transfer. Um, Long-term pie in the sky, if we're licensed and we have staff available, that could certainly be something available to us in the future. There's a lot of additional administrative stuff that happens, staffing needs, things like that, um, that I wouldn't expect to see it soon, um, but it's certainly one of those things that, you know, as we grow, if we have that extra crew that's otherwise not doing anything, if we took a local person to the hospital and now they need to get home by ambulance, we'd be primed for that. We know where they live, we have that continuity of care, um, we're a local community member just as they are, and that would be an opportunity for us to recoup some of that cost for that staff, absolutely. But John, to your point, we do spend, I don't know if you have this, the, the data, but the <coughs> revenue we generate from um, going to Winfield, mm -hmm. and going to, they're not intercepts, they're, they are they intercepts. intercepts. Yeah. What, what revenue is generated from that that does offset the cost to taxpayers in, in the three towns? Yeah, so every, we have intercept agreements with towns. So unlike mutual aid, we're required to go and help. An intercept is they call and they say, we have an ambulance, we need a paramedic. We have agreements and 
we negotiate that cost, but it's typically around $275 that we just charge. Um, so if we intercept a Greenfield fire, let's say hypothetically, they would bill the patient normally and Greenfield cuts us a check for $275. Um, that's, we didn't have to really use any equipment of our own. Um, we had to use a vehicle to get there, but even just that $275 pays for that paramedic shift right there. I mean, we, it, we actually make a little bit of money, you know, they cost a little bit less than that for an eight hour shift. So, um, so by doing those intercepts, by making ourselves available, not only are we increasing the health of the community, but we're actually getting a return on the investment that we're making. And they happen relatively frequently. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, a few times we go in spurts, um, like the moon phases. Um, might be a couple times a week. We might not do a single one for three weeks, and we might do four in a week. Um, but it's it's uh, it's enough that I'm happy that we can do it, and um, and we can see that. Is that only our first ambulance, or is that? Yeah. So the requirement is that we have to have a second ambulance available for our service area in order to agree to do that intercept. So that is part of our agreement, that if Greenfield says we want an intercept, we have a right to decline. And our on-duty crews, our paramedics say, yep, there's the second ambulance right there in the station, uncommitted. We will go and do that call, and we won't leave our area uncovered. So um, that is part of our, our protocol, our policy. OK, I've got one other just quick question. I, I, I believe you guys are working on uncollected debt. Mm -hmm. I've been listening to your meetings. Yeah. Are you comfortable that the SCEMS is not paying for Deerfield's old ambulance debt? Is that a separate issue? Those are wholly separate. Yeah, those are maintained separately. They're actually being um, dealt with separately by separate staff. <clears throat> we use the same billing company um, for both the former Deerfield EMS and now South County EMS. So instead of doubling efforts, you know, we're finding common language and answering some of the common questions, but they are wholly dealt with absolutely separately. Okay, and yeah. that'll just reflect on Deerfield's budget. Correct. Okay. Yeah, the, those, those monies have been set aside and carved out um, at South County EMS's inception. So right. there's, no, there's no overlap. Wonderful. Yep. So, so have you ever had an audit done of your financials? Uh, the town of Deerfield has a yearly audit done of their financials. Um, includes yeah, that's the yeah, the yeah, 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 yep. And uh, we get regular reports from our like aging, um, aging debt reports from our billing company and things like that. Um, and that's what the, we're in the process of dotting the T's and crossing the I's now is making sure that we approach that debt in a meaningful and objective way. Um, that. Um, we're doing what we need to do legally and fairly to, to everybody that might be represented in that debt. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. Thank you. And thank you all. To See you next time. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Uh, our business uh, Health Insurance, Hampshire County Group Insurance Trust. I just, Brian, I, I just wanted to let you know this isn't. Yeah. This hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, okay. The meeting with uh, uh, Joe Shea, he's the head of the insurance trust, on October 18th. The other town administrators from the Frontier Towns. Uh, we really need them to focus on next steps and um, start getting us. There was a meeting that didn't happen, or no? This is a meeting with just the four town administrators. Okay. Um, oh, okay. And it has happened. It has not happened. It will happen October 18th. Oh, okay. Um, but we really need to have them start focusing on getting us the information we need to continue with this process in each of our towns and all the towns in the, yeah. in the trust. Yeah. Um, Remember how much they needed our vote in July? There was, there was, really, it, there was really a false start and it was, yeah. it was not great in my opinion. Um, but we need to move forward. So um, yeah. just wanted okay. to keep that up. So who's in, who's in touch with Jennifer Kellogg right now on this? We should keep her up to date. Oh, it's now um, Emily Emily Kynan. Okay. Well, who's in touch with with that entity? Yes. Um, they should be aware. Yeah. Transparency. So I will make sure. Yeah. Okay. There was some there in in Jennifer's note, um, which has an October fourth date. She talked about um, tomorrow's meeting. I think. Um, 
knowledge yeah, at that, today's meeting. That was that they had some wrong information. Oh, okay. okay. That was actually a. So there was not a vote taken at a meeting on that day. October, um, not on October fifth. No. no. Oh, okay. So this vote that she may be talking about has not yet occurred. The, the the Hampshire County Group Insurance Trust has been has been has been voting to make changes. It's a done deal, right? Yes. Um, yeah, I think it's. I think they're fairly set on on the changes they're going to propose. Mm. Um, and you know, we're in the position where where we purchase our insurance through the trust, or we purchase it through whatever other whatever other entity provides it. But there's there's not a lot of other entities. That Do we have a representative it. on the Hampshire? Yeah, Lynn is. Lynn is. Yeah. So she's been involved with this yeah. all along. Is she uh, yeah, the tre involved in the treasurers from the from the towns? And when did they make the decision? When did they make this vote? Um, well, they started discussing this when we first when we first had this when we first had these discussions. So that was July. Yeah, summertime. Mm -hmm. That's that's when they started having these discussions. Yeah. Um, but but I, I thought they weren't going to act until they had had a few further conversations with. Uh, I'm confused. I, I don't feel like there was transparency involved here. I think as a whole, the entity is not that transparent. Um, hmm. I, I hope to find out a lot more information. And this is run out of okay. the Hampshire. Sinking ship. Uh, cock. Cock. Okay. Which. So and, and I, I, I think there's a movement yeah. for separation, but I'm not sure. Okay, so so Lynn and other town treasurers are uh, there. Uh, they are the, our representatives on this. Yep. Because we have a voting representative, and so do we know what changes they voted on? Because we have this voting representative, or um, is that person willing to tell us? We do, or, and they're keeping you up to date. Um. Yes, yeah, so we've had conversations. Oh, okay. Um, I'd like to have detailed conversations on October eighteenth. Okay. Um, okay. Because there's a lot of information and details that we need, and communication has not been great. Okay. Please um, keep from the trust to okay. the communities. Please keep. Um, okay. So I'm hearing. Let me get a job. Just these guys. <laughs> you know, I don't have answers yet, but they're coming. Okay. Keep these guys in the loop. And, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Moving on. New business. Mass uh, DEP paper compactor installation certification. This is for. The responsible official, and that's Fred. Okay. This is paperwork that says we have switched, we have installed our mixed-use paper compactor yeah. at the transfer station, and it is operating. It's just a formality. Okay. Um, want me to continue? Mm -hmm. Yes. Hazardous mitigation plan and grant. Our has our multi-hazard mitigation plan. Mm -hmm. which is this will expire in 2019 so if we work back NEMA is offering grants to communities um, to begin revising their plans in the fall of 2018 mm. so this is a yeah this is a requirement for us to get net um, hazard mitigation plans or grants from FEMA or NEMA the most recent one we have from what I can tell is the the Mill River Bank stabilization um, mm -hmm. project that happened so it's a good idea to keep this up to date in my opinion so um, if we have your permission um, submit a letter of intent it requires a letter of intent um, absolutely I think that sounds like an um, and I'll, but I'll, I'll have you sign that letter um, okay. when it's drafted okay. Um, okay. moving right along licensing fees yes You've all met Janet, right? Yep. Okay. And Janet put this together. These are Thank our you, Janet. You're welcome. These are our current fees. These are the fees of our mm -hmm. of some of our neighbors. When did they last go up? Or does it vary from it's a, it's I think it was a hodgepodge of I mean, ours has been it's been a couple of years probably. I think so. Yeah, I don't remember doing it any time recently. I think it it might have been like one um, 
I feel like it was three or four years ago we raised some of them, but I don't think we did a lot of changes the last time. Um, if you will compare to our neighbors were. Yeah. Good. Well, when you think about location, location, yeah, location, more. then yeah. similarities between Hatfield and Deerfield and Waitley seem to be the most relevant. Yeah. And uh, I, I was noticing on the common victuallers license that Hatfield is way expensive, but they don't have something as an inholder all alcoholic beverages, which it is close to the same, same price. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not sure. If that's, uh, I would also wonder if that could have been a um, just a typo. A typo. That's what I was wondering. I I would. So, 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 so that you can really serve food on the premises, and that's yeah, that's uh, it. I think serve and eat food on the premises. Yeah. yeah. Um, the general on-premise alcoholic beverages seasonal was initiated when Quan Quan went into business. That was. Quite a while ago now. I mean, we, we initiated that purposely because it was the, they were unique. Right. Seasonal. But, but the, the deal was we were just taking our yearly and saying, well, how many months do you want? And dividing it in half. That's true. That's, that's half, very fair point. You want it. Yeah. So, so it was really prorated on a monthly basis. And my guess is this number is for six months. Yeah, that's a very fair point. Um, and then, you know, if somebody wanted seven months, they wouldn't have to pay for a whole year. Yeah. That Long was, um, and, and, and we didn't want to go in weeks, right? <laughs> yeah. um, do, do we have a total for each one of these towns, what they collect for all of these? No, oh, I, well, I don't have that information. This was information that um, Mary Ellen asked for just their their prices for those particular things to compare to us. And how much is collected is, is predicated on how many entities within each row right. exist. Yeah. But we so. should know for our own what we have, right? If you want to. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an easy thing. We could probably do if we thought about who's in town. Mm. You know, the only one, you know, if you look across the board, you know, could we go up on our jukebox fee? Sure, but there's no, I mean. It doesn't seem like a compelling income source. Unless it's one, unless it's some of some the, the diner where there's a jukebox at every one of the tables. The, the other part of that is also jukebox, but it, I think if I read the information correctly, it was yeah. if there were other entertainment devices, in which case it would be per device. So it might not have been just 22, it might have been 22 times per, or eight, times whatever it is, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It's That's still a, a minimal amount of money. Uh, the only one that I recall was the Whaley Diner, and I, I think when they switched ownerships, they got rid of whatever was there. Or whatever was there had not been there for a while, but they, were still, still, jukeboxes, but they were still paying their fees. So they still have those jukeboxes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Then we got some wrong information. Yeah. Oh, they're trying to hide the jukeboxes from our tyrannical taxation. Uh, so what are, you, what are you asking us here to approve you, this, this so, schedule? So these would be the fees for fees? calendar year 28, uh, what are we now? Yeah, 2018. Mm -hmm. Which are the same as what we existing, so all these are existing fees. Yep. I, I honestly have no problem keeping them the same as last year. Okay, I'll okay. second the, the, I'll yeah, second the, the yeah. motion there. The, there's, I mean, there's differences on any given one, but they're not hugely different from, if I really just look at Hatfield and Deerfield, they're not hugely different. Yeah. Okay. okay, so. I'm, I'm good with that. Everybody but, okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Health insurance, start day vote. And um, we can pass over this item. We had it, um, an interpretation from Speaking of Hampshire County, a group insurance trust about um, a policy that we may have needed to adopt that would have allowed um, different start dates on your health insurance. We talked about the personnel policy. Yeah. Um, whether it's, so there's an option, whether it's on your date of employment, date of hire, or the first month, or, mm -hmm. or the next first month. The first of the next um, month. And um, that was at the request of Hampshire County Group Insurance Trust, but um, they don't think that's required. Well, any more to do that? Okay. So we don't. There's 
do have nothing to talk about. I'll be quiet. Good. Okay. Moving on, town administrator updates. Um, is this is where we talk about free cash. Okay. I've been waiting all day, all meeting then. I mean, yeah. All meeting. We owe, no, just kidding. Um, free cash is, the pulmonary certification is just under $800,000. And which, which made my jaw dropped on that. It, it, it yes. was pretty amazing. So I'll, I'll put it in perspective. Uh, Please. So 200,000 of that is, is an amount of free cash we didn't spend from last year. So that mm. rolls over. Mm. Um, and 200, that, the $200,000 from the Covestro overlay um, to mitigate the pending loss of that. That was released money. by the Board of Assessors last year. Yeah. So now we see that money flipped over into free cash. So what I heard, now my ears are not necessarily, I heard you say Covestrio overlay. So um, Covestrio. when Covestro first started paying personal property tax, um, mm. it was decided that their first payment should be put into a tax overlay account because there was some uncertainty as to whether they actually owed um, that money. Um, so the Board of Assessors voted last fiscal year to release that money from the overlay account. And that was a 200,000. 200,000. So that flipped into free cash. Oh, okay. So that was revenue. It was counted as a revenue last last fiscal year, so now it's available as free cash. Okay. It was revenue so, that was not available last Right. So 400,000 of that is accounted for. Accounted for. Um, and the rest, the 300 and some change is it's free cash. So before the feeding frenzy begins, it start, Which is a lot, it start that's, yet? that's a lot more typical. Three hundred something thousand. Four, four is yeah, three, right. just for, yeah. Three, so. Yes. Yeah. But because of the two, but well, not really because we always have some left over from the previous numbers. year, so it is a bit higher. Yeah. But yeah. I would caution people that we really are in unknown territory, uncharted waters. What other? <laughs> Cliche, you want to um, cliche I can use. Mm. We got to be, and the finance committee, I'm sure, will be paying close attention to this as right. they as they do a good, great job of. But we shouldn't just be lining up saying money's available because okay. our budget is an unknown at this point. Factors. So, I, I, just a cautionary tale that just because it's there doesn't mean we have to spend it. Right. Well, we could have some major projects coming up too. Exactly. Besides the town hall, I mean, there's other projects. Yeah, yeah. There's water, the the water district. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff. So and let's. The elementary right. school. Yeah. The elementary well, school. Also, possibly so. But even in years when we when it's certified and it's at three hundred and something thousand, that's the the next year's budget is still really tight. Right. You know, we don't we're not and operating it, where we're, we're operating pretty close to our two and a half limit as it is and so uh, I guess that amount of money compared to our total budget which is five million ish pretty close yeah <laughs> um, <coughs> that bit of excess is not as big as it might sound right right uh, even though it's like oh it's twice what it was before well twice a small number is still a small number <laughs> and, um, and although we, you know, it may allow us to do some things that we not been able to do in the past. But but Fred, but we have some we have some bills that we have some things that are going to come school, to school, yeah. water, and we had so many years of not doing much in the way of of capital, okay. right? Um, that we still we haven't really uh, done justice to the to those sorts of things that some of it's like borrowed time, right? Yeah, a lot of it. You know. So, okay, Brian, what else you got? Um, two other items we can talk about. Um, our consultant is still negotiating with Nexamp mm. um, for the solar pilot agreement. They are still going back and forth on, on what the proper valuation is of the of the two uh, solar arrays to be constructed in the town. So that is to be continued. And we t we talked a little bit about this last year. The Maya. Um, issues loss prevention grants. So this last year, this paid for um, the installation of four backup cameras on the uh, the DPW trucks. So that grant, uh, that grant round is 
open again, and uh, it's our to uh, November second. So, if you have any thoughts about items that could be paid for, I saw some discussion about this, and did uh, good ideas popped up from various people. Um, John Hannum had the idea of, of backup cameras for the fire trucks. Um, the idea. Mm. Um, Last year we were talking about body cameras for the police departments. I still like uh, that idea. Is it only one thing, or can you do multiple? We submit a mul You can submit multiple ones. Last year they only funded okay. one of. And they'll fund whichever one they choose, as right. opposed to. Can you prioritize them? We can try. This would be our one A, and this would be our one B. Yes, we could try. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just something to. So those are due November second. It's a really simple application. We just need a. Uh, a recent cost estimate for the work. Um, so, as of last year, the chief wasn't in favor of body cameras. He wanted more. I think mean, he wanted more input, more thought going into. He's not opposed, but he can put in. He 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 can he put in the application for okay. for, for this grant program. He did, yeah. Okay. I, I think he also wanted to have a conversation with others in terms of anecdotal. How has it worked? I don't know if there's had that, and it's a question I can ask him. Yeah. No, I guess he had a privacy concern. Yeah, which I get, but you know, there's a, there are trade offs to everything you do. Sure. I think I've seen statistics on it. I don't think there's many in Franklin County that have it. I mean, there's very few. But why shouldn't it be? Not. I, I know, but I mean, you've got these other police departments that are yeah. maybe more and more well, maybe uh, we can active than us, us, but I, yeah. It's not saying we shouldn't have it, but it's but it, that's not the trend yet. I don't think for every police department in Franklin County. County but I, I like being ahead of the curve as opposed to behind the curve. Yeah, I, I mean, for example, when we started taping meetings in the towns, there was similar resistance uh, to to trying to do that. And what we've found in case after case after case, having the meeting taped protected the town. It, it did, and people would come in and say, well, I'm gonna sue you because you told me such and such at your meeting, and they pull the tape and say, you didn't say such and such at the meeting, this is what we said. And, you, and you, so you have the, the evidence there. Um, and for that reason, if nothing else, that it tends to be protective of people who are trying to do their jobs, which is a hard job, then I think it's a good idea. That's what, that, and that's, no, I guess that's what I'm. No, what I'm paid to do here is to. to I think we'll wait to. <laughs> we'll, know what I think. We'll wait to hear from the police chief. I guess. Yeah. I but but that. how about if we, and I can and I can have a conversation with him about it. But how about for the next meeting, which is for the 25th? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have a list that we can choose from of the options. Paul, John Hannum again, Jimmy. Yeah. Keith, whoever else. You, I, yeah. you know, and get a list, and then we can, we can decide. But we, I think we need a list to decide from. Yeah, I think. Twenty. Yeah. Yep. That'll give you enough time to. Do we, to, do to, we need to, to look to at, at security for the town buildings? That's a possibility. Any of our town buildings we have? I mean, they're all impenetrable, but yeah, it wouldn't right. work. You said this is a um, waste. Uh, it's a, uh, a loss prevention. Loss prevention ranch. So it's loss from the, from our from my the yeah. insurance company. Right. So it needs to be related. There's very specific categories. So it needs to be related to different categories. So, okay. Or right. loss. Okay. Let's get that list, and I'll, I'll talk to okay. Chief Sir. Communication. Okay. Okay. What else? Um, I think that's it for now. Did we hear anything on the new growth certification? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, you handed out something here. Okay, for COG celebration Friday is you have to register for this or just, no, just show up. Just show, show, up. show up. Yeah. Okay. 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 Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Favor. Aye. Okay. All right.